Hi everyone, welcome to our new lecture of CSE 114 during the summer of 2018. Please uh, ask any questions you want during the lecture in the class uh, chat on the left hand side, on the right hand side, and uh, the TAs and me will try to respond. I will stop from time to time to actually take questions, and we will respond to these questions as soon as. Um, the lecture basically stops from time to time. Just to respond to Yanling question, uh, it doesn't matter if you didn't submit your uh, net ID. Okay. So today we'll cover inheritance and polymorphism. We talked about object-oriented thinking and objects and classes last time. We learned how to define a class. We learned how to define objects, multiple objects of that class. Um, just as a simple example, before we start, uh, let's just remember how do we define classes and how do we define, uh, uh, how do we declare objects of those classes. So let's start with a simple example. Let's create a new class. Let's call it person or person, my person. And in this new class, my person, objects of the class, my person have, let's say, a string name. It's normal to define properties as private. Then we can define a constructor for my person, public my person, takes a string as a parameter, and we define the name data field to be equal with the name and in the main method you can have this main method in another class for instance we can define multiple my person objects similarly we can define the second one with its own properties and uh, data fields. Now, let's also define a method for returning a string representation of this object. So when we actually call system.out.print p1 will actually print Paul and when we print p2 it will print John. In addition to one data field we can have as many data fields as we want. Like for instance uh, we can define the age and also add it, let's create multiple constructors. We can create people with their name or people with their age and name. So now let's say that we add an age to John and we can also concatenate the string with the possible age. In the case of the default parameter, uh, it will actually set the value as zero. Now, this is actually what we covered last week. We basically covered how to declare a class and use that class to define multiple objects, instances of that class. What if we actually want to extend this class? Like for instance, we would want to have an additional class, let's call it my student, and my student extends pers my person. 
So basically, we want to have all the data fields of my person with additional data fields for my student. So let's say that the student also has a double GPA. It inherits everything from person. And in addition to that, it also inherits uh, the uh, basically we can use the constructors. So let's assume that we have a my student constructor where we create a new uh, my student with the name and the GPA. And in addition to calling the superclass constructor to create a person with a given name, we also set the GPA. Let's equal with the GPA. So the advantage in this ca uh, case is that we don't have to redefine all the data fields that we had for the superclass my person. We basically inherit all of those data fields. We can access the name. We can access the age if we uh, can if we set it. In addition to that, it only adds additional data fields, like for instance the GPA. Now, another feature of inheritance is the fact that we can override the methods from the superclass. Like, we can define our own method to string, which returns the fact that this is a student. And again, we can add the GPA, let's say. So now in the main method, we can actually one of these could be a, a student. So basically John is a student and by default every student is also a person object when we invoke p2 to print john it will actually print the fact that this is a student with the gpa 4.0 so today we'll talk about inheritance what does it mean to extend another class and how can we override the methods from the super class to, to basically give specific implementations in the subclass so let's return to the lecture notes. So we'll start again with a motivating problem. And our motivating problem in this case is that last time we declare we defined a paint application with multiple geometric objects like circles, rectangles, triangles, and so on. And all of them have common features. Like for instance, all of them have, let's say, a color, when it was created, if it's filled or not, and so on. So all of these data structures or all of these types of, uh, of uh, geometric objects have common features like color. Let's actually add it here. When it was created, where, uh, if it's filled or not. And in addition to that, we also have methods. Like for instance, for all of them, we can get their area or we can get their perimeter. So inheritance is actually to design this kind of super classes to avoid redundancy. We define all the common properties in one super class, and then we can implement subclasses that implement specific properties only for those geometric objects. So we'll implement a class geometric object with the common properties like color, when it was created, field or not, with common methods like, for instance, get area and get perimeter. Although we cannot implement in those uh, in the class itself, we can actually define that they are abstract. The fact that they will definitely exist in the subclasses. That means that it's a constraint that any subclass of the superclass must implement these common methods. So inheritance means that we avoid redundancy by designing superclasses 
And again, if we have multiple color circles, they will all implement uh, the same method get area. And the same for multiple color circles and rectangles. And many other geometric objects. They will all implement the methods get area. Okay? So let's exactly know what this means. It means that we will implement one class geometric object with the data fields color field date created and methods for the geometric object, constructors, geometric object, geometric object that creates a geometric object with a given color and a given Boolean data field field. Get color, we return the color of this geometric object is an accessor for that data field. Set color will set the color to a given color string. These are public methods as opposed to the private data field, which we cannot access directly. Is field is an accessor for a Boolean data field. It will return true or false was the value of field. Set field sets the data field to a new Boolean value. Get date created returns an object instance of the Java util date and to string returns a string representation of the geometric object. Now all of these methods are part of geometric object and the methods that are not constructors will be inherited by the subclasses. So in our case we can define a class circle that extends geometric object and the class rectangle that extends geometric object. Circle will add an additional data field radius to the data fields that in, it inherits from the geometric object and rectangle will add additional data fields width and height to the ones that it inherits from geometric object. Then each of these two classes declares its own constructors, its own methods for getting the additional parameters and in addition to that, it defines the two methods get area and get perimeter. So in the super class, we will see that we will actually define the fact that get area and get perimeter must be implemented in all the subclasses. So let's just skim over the implementation of these classes and then actually get into the specific rules for every one of these classes and the specific rules for inheritance. Uh, constructor chaining, uh, overriding methods, and uh, polymorphism. So how do we declare a class? In the case of geometric object, we declare it as a class geometric object. Later we will see that this is an abstract class. The meaning of this keyword is that it cannot, we cannot create an object instance of geometric object directly. We have to create instances of the subclasses in our case, circle, rectangle, and other subclasses of geometric object. In addition to that, the keyword abstract also means that there may, there may be abstract methods, methods that are not actually implemented in this class, but they are only constraints of the sub, on the subclasses. So if we want to ignore these, we can actually ignore them. We can just declare the class as we had up to now. We declare a class geometric object and it contains only the methods that we have in the class. It does not contain those abstract methods. The abstract methods really, they add functionality uh, of the fact that we have constraints on the subclasses and we have, we cannot create a class directly, a class instance of this class. Okay, but that's a topic that we'll cover next class when we talk about abstract methods and interfaces. So at this point we declared a class geometric object with all the data fields that we see and which are the two data field, the three data fields, color, field, and date created, and the two constructors, one that creates a default geometric object with the color of white and the current date, and another constructor and another and the data and the field is field it's false by default. Then we have geometric object which takes color. Uh, as a string and a boolean field parameter and again it creates a, cons uh, a date, uh, uh, 
date object which is assigned to the date created and it calls uh, it uh, assigns the color and field to the formal parameters color and field now one thing that we can do is we can actually instead of calling the dish to create a, a date created we can call like we learned in the previous class the super class constructor the constructor for the same class with no parameters so in this case it basically uh, calls the other constructor to create a date of the current class okay the rest of the methods are actually uh, simple we return the color of the current dramatic object we return we can set the color this is a modifier we can return the field data field and we can set the uh, field data field to a given value we can return the date created or we can return a string representation of the current geometric object so now how do we implement classes that extend this class they are called subclasses of geometric object the class circle extends geometric object with additional methods and additional data fields so it adds to the ones that were defined in the super class color field and date created the uh, private data field radius in addition to that it defines two constructors a constructor that creates a default circle this circle we have a data field uh, uh, radius equal with zero but it will also have the three data fields color equal with white field equal with uh, uh, false and date created created by the constructor of geometric object that creates uh, an object of the current date so one statement that is actually implicit in the in both constructors in in this case is the fact that we can act we actually call the superclass constructor for geometric object as the first call in 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 the method circle so in fact there is an implicit super in the circle uh, constructor and so is also in the next constructor we have an implicit calls call to the super class constructor the default super class constructor unless we have one explicitly okay we will learn what that means basically it means that before it actually creates the object of the type circle it actually creates an object of the type of the super class and then it actually adds the additional data fields of circle so before any statement is executed in the constructor for circle we actually have a call to the super class constructor to create an object instance of the super class now the rest of the methods are either accessors and mutators for the radius are implementations of get area and get diameter and get perimeter that return basically the area the diameter and the perimeter of the circle and finally a method print circle that prints the current circle in a similar way we implement the class rectangle the class rectangle extends also geometric object has additionally to the color field and date created of geometric object width and height we have three constructors one constructor that creates a default rectangle one constructor that creates a rectangle with a given width and height and one constructor that creates a rectangle with a, a given width height color and field in the case of color and field we call the super class constructor which is the geometric object constructor which takes a string and the boolean as inputs so super is a keyword like this that we saw uh, in the previous class super calls the super class constructor or access is a method in the super class that is hidden in the current class so for instance uh, the super in this case will call the geometric object constructor with the color and field if we don't have a call to the super class constructor like in the previous two methods we will have one by default basically the first statement in the constructor itself 
before calling, before executing any other statements, is actually a call to the superclass constructor with no parameters or the default superclass constructor. So here I made it explicitly. In the one below, it will be implicitly before we call the constructor for rectangle, we can act we actually in the constructor for rectangle we call the superclass constructor. Now, what is the meaning of all this? Basically, the meaning is that the superclass defines additional data fields. It can also define methods which must be implemented by any by all the subclasses. And those were the two abstract methods that you saw before and you have in the lecture notes. We have two abstract methods, public, that returns a double abstract get area. The meaning of this abstract is that the method doesn't have an implementation yet. We have no, no sizes for a generic geometric object, therefore we cannot create, compute its area. And similarly, we have public abstract double get perimeter. Again, we have no implementation for perimeter because we have no sizes. And since we have abstract methods, we must also have this class should be abstract. The meaning is that we cannot create instances of geometric object and these two methods must be implemented in the subclasses. So basically we can leave here a comment. I will update the lecture notes later. These methods must be implemented in the subclasses. So this is basically the meaning of abstract. Now, what it means is that we can actually create multiple geometric objects. We can create C as a new circle, R as a new rectangle, and then call the method getArea, even for an apparent object of the type geometric object, because we know that any geometric object must have a method getArea, because that method was defined as abstract in the geometric object. So any class that would implement extend geometric object must implement the methods get area get per, uh, perimeter. We'll see the meaning of abstract a little bit later. Uh, in, in fact, in the next class, for the moment we can basically just look at this code. Uh, we'll get into details later. We call display object with C. C was a geometric object and the class geometric object did not extend any other class, so by default it actually extends the class object. So we get an object in the in the method display object and we check if it's an instance of a circle. If it is, then we print the area of the circle. If it's uh, and the diameter of the circle. If it's if it's not, then we check if it's an instance of a rectangle and again print the area of the rectangle. Now before we are able to print the area, either of the rectangle or of the circle, we need to cast that object to a geometric object, in the case of circle to a circle, in the case of rectangle to a rectangle. Even in these cases, we can actually modify this and cast it directly to geometric object because we know that get area is available for all geometric objects. We cannot do that for diameter because that was not defined as abstract in uh, the class geometric object, but we can do that for, uh, for the rectangle uh, get area because that's defined in the subclass. And just to show you that this is in fact all working and is correct, I will show you everything working in Eclipse. So we have the class geometric object as was defined in the lecture notes. We have the class circle as it was defined in the lecture notes, rectangle, and finally the test class 
that creates two objects and calls the method display object on each one of them. So in this case, it will basically print the area of the circle and the diameter and the rectangle area. So what we see here that we are calling the uh, object display object with object one and object two, but that takes an generic object as the input is in fact polymorphism that we can actually call with a subclass object like in our case a geometric object uh, circle we can actually call the method the uh, display object okay so let's get into details there is a lot of details that we need to cover before we understand everything that we saw in these programs so first thing we extend the class we define that uh, some class a extends another class or by default that the class a extends by default the superclass object are the constructors inherited? The answer is no, they are not inherited. They are the only methods that are not inherited. They are invoked either explicitly or implicitly. Explicitly using the super keyword and the statement has to be the first statement in the constructor for the subclass. So for instance, if we have a, a class A which extended some superclass B, it doesn't matter what it extends, it extends one superclass we can use explicitly the keyword super to invoke the superclass constructor, either the empty constructor or another constructor in the superclass. If the keyword super is not explicitly used, then the superclass no argument constructor is automatically invoked as the first statement in the constructor unless another constructor of the same class is invoked explicitly with the this keyword. When the last constructor in the chain in the chain will actually invoke the superclass constructor. So what the meaning of that is the following: that if we have a class, let's say B, and the class A is a subclass, it stands the class B. The class A call uh, the constructor for the class A, even if it doesn't have a superclass constructor invoked explicitly that is equivalent with actually invoking the superclass constructor explicitly as the first statement in the current class. If we have a class A with some parameters and again we have some uh, constructor and we have some statements, again the superclass constructor is invoked implicitly before any statement in that constructor is actually uh, executed. So this superclass constructor is either implicitly uh, invoked or explicitly using the super keyword. So the super keyword can actually refer to the superclass and it doesn't we don't need to say explicitly that the class B is the superclass uh, and invoke the class B constructor. Whenever the class the superclass the super keyword appears it means the superclass and this keyword can be used in two ways. It can be used to call a superclass constructor and Java requires that the statement that uses the keyword super appears first in the constructor again unless there is another constructor that is called or the superclass constructor is called explicitly and uh, to call a superclass method and we'll see what that means. Basically we can call from the subclass a superclass method that is currently overridden in the current subclass. But first we start with constructor chaining. So constructor chaining means that when we construct an instance of a subclass, before we can construct the instance of the subclass, the superclass constructor is invoked. But that superclass may also have its own superclasses. So in fact, we have a chain of constructors. The current constructor for the current subclass instance invokes all the superclass constructors along the inheritance chain. So if we define a class faculty that extends employee and employee extends person and person by default extends the class object, that's the superclass of all classes in Java. If in a main method we create a new faculty before we actually execute the print statement inside the faculty constructor, uh, 
we call the superclass constructor implicitly. Okay. So what this means is the following. We may have a main method in which we create a new faculty. Before we actually create a new faculty, we actually, because of the fact that faculty extends employee, we call the employee constructor. So there is an implicit super key, uh, constructor called as the first statement of faculty constructor. Now, the employee constructor calls another constructor of the class employee with a keyword this. So all of those specific cases before were saying that the superclass constructor will be called unless another constructor of the same class is called. So this is that unless case, the specific case that we call another constructor, in this case, one that takes the string of employee, employee that takes a string, and this is the last constructor in the chain. We don't call another constructor with the keyword this. So that unless statement said that you call the superclass constructor unless another constructor is called in, the, in this case. And the last constructor in the chain will call the superclass constructor. So because of the fact that employee extends person, we have an implicit superclass constructor called in the employee constructor. And that's the default person constructor, which prints actually the first statement. So Although in the main method we were creating a faculty, the first statement get, that gets printed, no argument constructor is involved, is the superclass constructor of uh, the person uh, constructor, which basically faculty called the employee constructor, the employee constructor calls another employee constructor, which called the superclass constructor of person. So the first statement that gets printed is one that person or argument constructor is invoked. Then we can actually execute the rest of the employee constructor with the string parameter. So in this case, it will print to invoke the no argument, const uh, the arg overloaded constructor employee that takes a string as a parameter. Then we return to the constructor for employee with no parameters, the default one and we execute the rest of the constructor. So in this case, employees no argument constructor is invoked. Then we return finally to the class faculty and we construct a faculty, we print the statement, the faculty no argument constructor is invoked and we return to the main method and we finish the main method. Okay, so let's see that this is indeed the case. Here we have the program that we saw before the faculty extends employee. We have the main method, which creates a new faculty. Before we execute any statement in the constructor for faculty, it calls the constructor for the super class with no parameters, which is employee. But employee calls another constructor of the same class. So we don't call yet the super class constructor. We call the constructor for employee with a string. And then we call the superclass constructor, which calls, in this case, person, default constructor, and prints the first message. So the first message that gets printed is person's no argument constructor is invoked. Once that finishes, we return to the employee constructor with a string, and we execute the rest of the statements in that method. When that is finished, we return in the employee constructor and we print the third message. And when that is finished, we return finally to faculty and we construct, we print the message to faculty, no argument constructor is invoked. So if we have this kind of hierarchy of constructors, in fact, the first constructor is called first, then the second one, then the third one, and so on. So actually, we can actually draw the UML diagram with violet and we are going to create a class diagram so we have the class person a subclass of person employee and 
we took constructors but we'll leave them for later to design them then this is a subclass of person we represent it with an arrow we can define now another subclass of employee which is faculty and that is a subclass also of employee so at this point basically the meaning is that if we want to create an object instance of faculty then we will need to create an employee first but if we want to create an employee we need to create a person first so first we have an object of the type person to which we add the data fields for employee to which we add the data fields for faculty so for any object instance of of faculty we actually call the employee and the person constructors in fact even more than that any class in java implements the super class of all the classes in java and that is object java lang object so for instance person implements object and so does let's say another class here geometric object and any other subclass of geometric object so this is a also a subclass of object and we have at least two subclasses of geometric object one was circle and one was rectangle So let's stop for a second and see if there are any questions about uh, constructor chaining. Any questions about constructor chaining? Yes, Dave? Yes, Jos, Joe? Very good question. In the employee class, in which constructor the superclass constructor is invoked? Great question. So, again, we have a special rule that says if the keyword super is not explicitly used, then the superclass no argument constructor is automatically invoked as the first statement in the constructor unless another constructor is invoked with the keyword this when the last constructor in the chain will invoke the superclass constructor so in our case basically we from the class faculty we call the faculty constructor from that we call the employee constructor but this employee constructor calls another constructor of the class employee so in fact it will call that first and from that point it calls the superclass constructor so we call the superclass constructor from the employee constructor that takes a string as a parameter and the reason for that is that it may we may actually call a different constructor a di different superclass constructor not the default one not the person one we can actually call person with a string so the last constructor in the current class in the chain will actually call the superclass constructor and is not last in the order but it last in the fact that it doesn't invoke another constructor of the same class with the keyword this okay any questions okay great okay another use for the method for the keyword super is to call a method from the super class like for instance a method that may be hidden in the super class 
because in, in the subclass because the subclass redefines it. But here we actually call a method that is not hidden. So any one of the methods that are inherited can be called with a super keyword. Like for instance in the print circle method, we print the circle is created and we want to get the date created. We can either call it directly, like just date created without super, or we can call it with super period date created which means that that method will be invoked in the super class. Most used case is when we actually define a sub uh, uh, a method in the subclass, which overrides the method in the super class, but we still want to have access to the method in the super class. We'll see that after we talk about overriding, which is actually the next uh, uh, stuff that we talk about. So what exactly does a super class do? A superclass extends the properties and the methods of the superclass. Basically, it, it, can, it inherits all the properties, data fields, and all the methods from the superclass, but in addition can add additional properties, can add additional methods, like for instance, get diameter in the case of circle, was not defined in the superclass as abstract, and only circles may have diameter or it can override the methods of the superclass. That means that it can define modified methods or more specific methods for the subclass. So method overriding it means when we modify in the subclass the implementation of a method defined in the superclass. Like for instance, in the class circle that extends geometric object, we define our own method to string. So now super.toString calls the superclass method to string, returns a string representation saying that this is a geometric object with a given color, uh, field, data field, and date created. But in addition to that, to string that is returned by, from the superclass to string method, we also add the radius and the radius in the current circle. So the method to string overrides the method to string defined in the superclass. So we modify in the subclass the implementation of that method defined in the superclass. Okay? We basically have a more specific implementation in the subclass of the method defined in the superclass. Okay? In, in addition to that, we are not required by anybody to actually uh, allow, to actually call the toString method from the superclass. We can just basically print a completely new implementation of the string method in the subclass, in the subclass circle. Okay. So an instance method can be overridden only if it's accessible. That means that if a method is private in the superclass, then it's not accessible in the subclass. If we define in the subclass a, a method that basically was defined as private in the superclass, the two methods are completely unrelated because we did not inherit the method from the superclass. We just redefined, we just defined the method in the subclass. A static method can be inherited which basically means that we can call that method from the using the subclass name instead of using the superclass name. A stated method cannot be overridden. We don't call overriding the fact that we call with the subclass name uh, the method in the subclass, and it basically uh, uh, that may be overridden, uh, may be redefined in the subclass. We don't call it overriding because it's not a case of overriding. We do inherit the method in the subclass that is defined in the superclass, but we are not overriding it. it. The terminology is a little bit different than in the case of non-static methods, but the functionality is in fact exactly the same. We can redefine the method in the subclass. If a static method defined in the superclass is defined in a subclass, the method defined in the superclass is hidden. So basically, if we call the method in the subclass from either another static method or from a, a non-static method, we call the current method in the subclass. It's just, a it's just 
uh, a difference in terminology. This slide is only about terminology that we don't call static methods overriding. Uh, we don't override private methods. We just define new private methods in the subclass. So let's actually understand the difference between overriding and overloading. Overloading was a term that we learned earlier this semester when we basically said that we can define multiple methods in the same class with different signatures. We can define p that takes a double and p that takes an integer. And if we call p with a, an integer, it will call the method that takes an integer. If we call p with a double, then it takes uh, uh, the method that takes a double, and it executes that method. Now, this is overloading. Basically, it's what we learned before. Even if we say that a class A extends a class B, and we define an overloaded method, now we have two methods, P, one that takes a double and one that takes an integer. So the class A that we have on the right-hand side does overloading. It defines two methods, P of integer I and P of double I that was inherited from the super class B. And now if we call P with an integer or with a double, it will actually execute the P of integer and the P of double. In the left-hand side, we have an example of, of method overriding. So in the class B, the super class, we have a method P that takes a double as a parameter. In the class A that extends the class B, we override that method P that takes a double with a different implementation. Basically, it prints I directly instead of printing double of I. The meaning being that if we invoke a dot p of 10, then we invoke the override, overridden method that takes a double in the subclass a. And if we actually call it with a double, it still calls the same method. In both cases, it will cast the integer to a double in the first case. In the second case, it will call the method directly with that double. So, in this case, we override the method p of double. p of double in the superclass b will be hidden by the implementation in the subclass. So this is overriding and this is overloading. If we call, for instance, we can also create an instance of the type b and call it with an integer and a double. In this case, it will print a double in both cases, basically 20.0 and 20.0. Because in both cases, it will call this method P with, uh, in defined in the class P. Any questions? So while you're thinking of questions, let's actually do this experiment. So we create a new class. Let's call it A. The class, the file may also contain other classes. Let's define the class B. And the class B may actually define the public method. P of a double. And it will return to the main method, let's print it there, d multiply with 2, class A extends class B, and it also defines and overrides the method P that takes a double and returns it. In the main method, we create an instance of A. And we call system.out.print P of an integer 10. And similarly, P of a double 10.0 for the, for the object A. So now if we run it, 
it will print 10.0 and 10.0. It basically uses in both cases the overriding me the overridden method. The only thing that we will change is that we say here this is an integer, in which case it will print 10.0 uh, 10 for the integer, and it will call the second method and will print 20.0 for the double. In this case, because of the fact that I'm returning a double, it will it print it 10.0. But let's return an integer, so it actually we can see that this p calls the method that takes an integer, and this p calls the method that takes a double. So this is an example of overloading. If we change this to double, then it's an example of overriding. And this one to a double. Then it's an example of overriding. The fact that this hides the method in the superclass. Any questions? Okay. So why is it useful? It's useful for the fact that we can actually implement more specific versions in the subclasses of the methods that are defined in the superclass. Mainly, there are two methods that are usually implemented in any subclass. And those are the two string method in the class object that gets inherited by all the subclasses and the equals method, which also is in implemented in the class object and inherited by subclasses. So the object class or Java length object is the superclass of all classes that do not have directly a superclass. So every class in Java is descendant from java.lang.object class. In fact, if no inheritance is specified when a class is defined, by default the superclass of the current class is java.lang.object. That means that if we define public class circle and we don't extend any other superclass, that is equivalent with public class circle extends object. So any subclass that or any class that does not have an explicit superclass extends the class object by default. Okay? The class object contains at least two methods, but there are a few more. There is a hash code method and so on. But the two string method is one of the methods that is implemented in class object and we can override it in any subclass. So the two string returns a string representation of the object. The default object implementation returns a string consisting of the class name, of which the object is an instance, and the at sign and the number representing that object. It's like an address in memory where that object actually is stored. But it's not really address because we, in Java we can't use those addresses for anything. So, for instance, we can create a class loan of the type loan, and we can invoke the method to string for the class loan, and it will display that there is a loan class at uh, this location, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, E, 6. Uh, it's just a hexadecimal number. We can't actually use it for anything else. In general, you should override the, the, the toString method so that it returns an informative string representing that object. So, for instance, in the case of a loan, it should actually return that this is a loan with given uh, data fields, like loan amount, uh, date, uh, period, interest, and so on. So, let's actually do an, again an experiment. Actually, I'm going to create a class loan. So, by default, it basically implement, extends the class object. So, ex we can do it explicitly, extends object, but this is not really necessary. Basically, any loan extends object. So in the main method, we can actually create a loan object. And print it. And we can call the method to string or we can actually use the method to string uh, directly and here we actually we see that it printed uh, 
it printed there is a loan at this location in memory okay so now if we want we can implement our own uh, method to string which op will overload the method to string from the object class so this will return this is a load object so in this case when we call the method to string it calls the more specific method for to string for this new loan so it will print this is a loan object so if we have any kind of data fields let's say the loan amount by default a thousand we can actually use it and print and print it so the two string method can be overloaded in the subclass that extends the class object I said that there is another method that is equals again we can ask if an object is equal with another object or we can implement our own method equals here so for instance we can print does the l equal another object and if we print it it actually says false no the loan does not equal another object that we just created but it may be that our loan is equal with another loan with the same amount so in this case does l equal l2 and our implementation of equals could compare the two loans so the signature has to be exactly the one that we have in the object class which takes an object as a parameter and in this case we return if the loan amount is equal with the loan amount of the loan object l2 and since they do have the same loan amount or o in our case it will print true yes these two loans are equal uh, l is equal with l2 in the loan amount now one thing that you saw here is casting the fact that object was an object o that was the signature of the class equals in order to override the, in, uh, of the method equals in order to override that method and we need to cast it to a loan before we get the loan amount for that loan okay we'll talk about that in a few seconds when we talk about polymorphism so what does it mean polymorphism it's actually a very complex term it means that an object of a subtype can be used whenever a super type value is required that means that we can define a method a generic method let's say m that takes an object uh, an x of the type object the superclass of all classes in java if we invoke that method m with a new graduate student or with a student or with a person or with a new object they are all going to work the reason why is that the class object was the super class of all classes in java so any object of any subclass is also an instance of the class object so as we draw it in the uml diagram earlier the class object is on the top everything else is a subclass of the class object if we have an object instance of faculty is an object if it has a, we have an instance of rectangle is an object okay so basically polymorphism means that we can define methods that take as the parent type of the object 
for instance the class object and then we can actually pass to that to that object to that uh, method any object that we want that is a subclass of that object so in this case the method m takes as a parameter an object and it can be invoked with any object in java so we can create a new graduate student we can invoke the method m and then for x which is the local formal parameter that represents the reference of that graduate student we invoke the method to string and the method to string will be the most specific method for a graduate student so in our case a graduate student does not have a two string method it extends the student superclass the student superclass has a method to string which returns student so for graduate student it will return and it will print as the first thing a student we finish the method m we return to the main method we call m with a new student object again we pass a new student to x which is a variable of the parent type object and we call the two string method again the two string method was already implemented in object but we will get the most specific implementation of two string so in our case for a student it will print student for a person, it will use a two-string implementation of that method in person. For an object, it will use the declaration of two-string in the object class, which basically prints that there is a Java lang object at that given address, uh, that basically it's an address in memory, a hexadecimal number, which is the hash code of that uh, object. So how does it work? How does every time every time we call the to string, it calls the more specific most specific method for that actual object? It does something called dynamic binding. It basically the Java virtual machine determines dynamically at runtime which implementation is used by the method, which is more specific for that type of object. So the to string method for that object will be actually invoked. Okay. So let's actually learn about dynamic binding. Suppose we have an object, and this object is an instance of the classes C1 to Cn. C1 is a subclass of C2, C2 is a subclass of C3, C3 is a subclass of C4, and so on up to Cn minus 1 is a subclass of Cn. Cn is the most general class. C1 is the most specific class. And now we invoke the method P, for the object O. The JVM will start searching for an implementation of the method P in C1, then in C2, then in Cn minus 1, up to Cn, in that order, until it finds, and then the search stops, and that fi first implementation of that method is the one invoked. So if the object is an instance of C1, we look in C1, is there a method P? If there is no method P, we go to the superclass of C1. Every class in Java has a single superclass. It's called single inheritance or single inheritance hierarchy. Every class in Java has a single superclass. So C1, if the method is not there, we go to C2. If the method P is not there, we go to C3 and so on until we find the method P. And then we execute that most specific implementation of the method p okay so here we have that example basically when we call x dot to string it depending on what is the actual object x it calls the to string method so for a graduate student there is no graduate student defined in the grad, uh, method to string defined in the graduate student class it goes to the class student and it prints student then it returns to the method m, it returns to the main method, and it calls the method m with a new student. A student has a method to string, so it returns student. Then it calls the method m with a new person. Person also has a method to string, so it calls person. It returns person and prints it. Then we return to the main method, we call the method m with a new object and it will use the two string implementation in the class object which prints that there is an object at that address in memory okay any questions about dynamic binding
can an object O be an instance of C1, C2, Cn when its instance of C1 isn't C1 a more specific class? So let's actually see an example. Earlier today we had the class faculty and we created an object instance of faculty. Okay, let's define this object. Let's call it object O is a new faculty. And now is this a faculty? And in Java, there is a specific operator is instance of which basically checks that the object is an instance of a class. So in this case, it basically says true. Yes, it's an instance of faculty. But faculty extends employee. So is O also an instance of employee? Yes. Every faculty is also an employee. So true, true. Is O also an instance of the superclass of employee, which was person? Yes, it's also a person. And is O also an instance of the superclass object? Yes. So the point being that if an object is an instance of a subclass, like O is an instance of faculty, it's also an employee, a person, an object, everything on that one path through the tree from the specific class to the root object of the inheritance hierarchy. Okay. Any questions? So you are right. O is an instance of C1, but if C1 is a subclass of C2, then we say that O is also an instance of C2. And this continues. So now O is an instance of C2, which is a subclass of C3, therefore O is also an instance of C3. And this continues up to the root, basically O is also an instance of object or Java lang object. Because any class in Java is an instance of uh, the superclass java.lang.object. Okay? So let's continue. Basically, we have, when we talked about uh, overloading versus overriding, a similar uh, difference is between matching, when we find a method that matches. Uh, the invocation according to the parameter type, the number of parameters and the order of parameters and this is done at compilation time and then there is method binding which is called dynamic binding which dynamically binds the implementation of the method at runtime. The most specific implementation of the method at runtime for that specific uh, subclass. Now in addition to that this whole thing is called generic programming. Basically, polymorphism allows us to define methods that can be used generically for a wide range of object arguments. If a method of a parameter type is a subclass, like for instance a superclass like object, you may pass any object to this method of any parameter subclass like student or string and this particular implementation of the method is invoked 
and determined uh, dynamically. So basically, we can define data structures at any uh, uh, level by using the superclass object. And that basically, uh, the superclass object is st stands for any possible object. So what I mean is the following. What is generic programming is defining superclasses of the class object and then we can create, for instance, a data structure for of students, a data structure of strings, and so on. Okay. So, for instance, let's assume that we define a stack, and we defined last time, last class a stack of integers. This time, we are going to define a stack of objects. So, if you remember. A stack is a data structure where we basically have two methods. Let's just remember that there was a push method. Let's comment it out for the moment. And the push method takes any object O and pushes it on the, onto the stack. And there it was a pop method. And this method pop takes the top of the stack and returns it so we can print it. So the class, the stack could be of any possible objects. It will work for, let's say, a stack of, uh, of loans or a stack of strings or a stack of objects or a stack of anything else. So this is a very generic data structure. If we would implement it with arrays as we did it last time, we can define the private array of objects as elements we can define a private data field size initialize with zero by default we can define a constructor which creates a class a standard stack of let's say 16 elements okay and this is basically the default number of elements we called it the stack of objects so now we can implement our push and pop methods so push takes any object and puts it on the stack and in order to make sure that the stack contains enough uh, elements let's check if the size is equal with the number of elements in elements then we have to create a new stack of objects And this must be at least uh, greater than the stack of elements. Normally, we should double the length. And we should copy the elements from the previous stack. So let's actually increase the size. So we copy the elements from elements starting at index 0 into temp starting at index 0 and the number of elements is elements dot length and we should redirect the elements to this new temporary uh, array and now we can assign to elements of size plus plus the object O and the method pop returns the top of the stack so return elements of minus 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 size so now if we have a public method 
this method may create a stack of objects. Let's call it O1. And it may be a stack of strings. So let's push multiple strings into it. And we can pop them out. So And we can create a stack of uh, loans. Let's say that we are a banker and we want to create basically a stack of loans objects. So now we can push into this new loan objects. And again, we can print them if we like to. and continue. So now basically the stack of strings will print uh, the strings. In our case we pushed and now we pop those strings uh, not equal with zero but equal with O. And the method loan uh, does not, uh, we actually cannot push up. We actually don't have we pushed into the wrong stack before. So it basically prints the loans that we created and we popped, uh, we push them into the stack. And um, so now we have a generic data structure, a, a data structure which takes any kind of objects and push them onto the stack. And we have the functionality for objects in general. Okay. So what, that is what generic programming is. It allows us to write methods that are used generically or data structures that are used generically. Now, in addition to that, we can actually cast objects from the superclass or the subclass into other classes. So casting can be used to convert an object of one class type to another within an inheritance hierarchy. So if we remember for primitive types, we had for integers and doubles that we had implicit casting when an object that is smaller, like an integer, can be assigned to a variable of the type double. And that implicit casting basically means that the object now can be assigned to the bigger type. Exactly the same is for object-oriented. For instance, when we invoke M of a new student of an object and a new student in this case, that's equivalent with assigning to a variable O of the type object an instance of the subclass new student. In this case, we have an implicit casting. It's legal because any instance of student is also automatically an instance of the superclass, in this case, object. So we can call M of O. How about the opposite. If we assign some object O to a, a, a variable of the type student, and that is a real object O, like it could be defined as an object defined before, or it could be any kind of object, an object created with uh, a new object constructor. In Java, you will get a compilation error. It basically tells us that object O is not necessarily an instance of student. If we know that is an instance of student, we should use explicit, explicit casting to tell the compiler that we know that O is an instance of student object. And the syntax is similar to the one that we use for primitive data, type, uh, data types. Like for instance, when we assign O to the variables B of the type student, we specify, we cast the object O to a student. This type of casting may not always succeed because the object O may not be a student, in which case we need to check with the instance of operator if the object O is a student.
So the instance of operator, it tes tests whether an object is an instance of a class. So for instance, if we say that my object is a new circle, but my object is of the parent type object, if we want to call any method of circle, we should first check if that my object is a circle. Because my object has the parent type object, not circle. So we check if my object is instance of circle. If it is, then we cast the my object to a circle. We do the same casting that we had before, and then we get the diameter of that specific circle. Okay? And this is basically how we write uh, casting demo uh, test uh, method uh, class for all of the geometric objects that we had before. So, for instance, circle one is assigned to object one, which is of the type object. New rectangle of one one is assigned to object two, and we call display object with the two, those two objects, object one and object two. If the local formal parameter object is an instance of a circle, then we cast that object to circle and we print the area and the diameter. Else, if the object is an instance of a rectangle, then we can cast the object to rectangle and get its own area. So before we, we assign we, or we call any method of that specific class like circle or rectangle, we cast the object to that specific class. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so let's continue then. Now, also, one of the methods defined in the object class is uh, the equals method. It compares the contents of two objects. The default implementation of equals in the object class is that it compares the references. Does the current object, which is symbolized by this keyword, is equal with the object object that is passed as parameter? So in this case, it compares the two references. Is the reference stored in this? is the same with the reference stores stored in object. Most of the classes in Java overwrite this method equals. So for instance, the Java util date, the Java length string classi, uh, classes, they implement the method equals. So they override the method equals from the super class. In the case of, let's say that we implement the class circle method equals, we write the same signature, public boolean equals takes an object O. We can change the name of the variable, but we can call O. We, can, we must use the same type. If O is an instance of circle, then we compare is the radius of the current circle equal with the object O's radius if the object O is cast to a circle. We must cast it to a circle before we can access the data field radius, although we know that now O is an instance of circle. If that is true, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. If the object O is not instance of, of circle, then it returns false by default. And this is the implementation here. Now, before we continue with array list, let's see if there are any questions. Okay. So let's implement the equals method in circle and rectangle. So again, we continue with circle. We can put it anywhere we want. In fact, I will put it here. Public boolean equals takes an object O and checks first if the object O is an instance of the class circle, only a circle could be equal with the current circle. If there is, then we return if the radius is the same. With the radius of the circle, 
all radius. Now, the truth is that we should also, we couldn't say that two circles are the same if they only have the same radius. We should also say that the two circles have the same uh, data field, field and color. So for the color, we can do it as follows. If get color, because that was a private property in uh, the super class, if get color equals the color of the circle O get color and we can continue basically if the color is the same and Let's say the field Boolean primitive data field is the same with the field of the circle O So if these are true we cannot also get this, we need to call the method is field. If this is true, let's check the parentheses. So this closes this parentheses, we need an additional parentheses to close the first one. Otherwise, we return false. Let's check all the parentheses. So the radius is the same with the radius of this circle and get color is the same with the color of this circle and this field is the same. Good. Similarly to this, we can write an equals method for rectangle. So for rectangle, two rectangles are the same if they have the same width and the same height and the same color So now we can actually compare two rectangles, two circles, and so on. In the test class, we can actually create two objects, which are two different circles, and we can check if they are equal. So let's actually do that. Is the object one? equal with object 2 and we can see that it will print true yes they are the same they basically have the same color the same radius and the data fields uh, field are both false any questions okay very good question so the question why do we need dot equals for color? Because the color was of the type string. It's not a primitive data field. And in Java, two strings are different. So for instance, in this example, if we actually modify in the geometric object the color to be a new 
string every time that takes while. Then if we change, let's say in circle, this dot equals into double equal, it will reply that the two circles are not equal. It will print false. And the reason why is that the two circles have different colors. So if we want to compare that the two colors are in fact, uh, that the two, the content of the two colors are the same, we need to use dot equals. So in this case, string is equal, uh, white is equal with white, and the two circles are indeed equal. So data, fil uh, data fields of the primitive type must be compared with double equal, and that includes height and uh, uh, width, which are double. Data fields boolean also is a primitive type, but data fields that are objects, we need to compare them with dot equals. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so we talked about generic data structures and generic programming. And in fact, we implemented our own class stack of objects. And you can create arrays to store objects. Basically, you can create an array of objects and it will store any kind of uh, uh, objects. However, the size of an array is fixed once you create an array. You can create a new array, copy the elements from the old array into the new array, and the new array may have, may have a different size, bigger. However, there is no way to actually have uh, an array that you can add elements and any number of elements in the array. Any number of elements, a hundred, a thousand, a million, a billion, and so on. However, Java provides one class that allows us to do that. It's called the ArrayList. It can be used to store an unlimited number of objects. So we can create an ArrayList. We can add an object to the ArrayList. We can add an object at a given index, which will shift the elements in the ArrayList with one position to the right from that index on. Uh, we can clear the array list, we can check if uh, uh, an object is contained in the array list, it will return a boolean, true or false. Uh, we can get the index, the first index of a given object, it returns the element in the list. Uh, we can actually get the element at a given object, we can get the index, the first index of, an, uh, of the element that matches the given object with equals. We can check if the array list is empty. We can get the last index of the array list of, of a given object. We can remove the object, which basically will shift all the uh, rest of the elements with one position to the left from the position of that object. We can get the size of an array list. We can remove an object at a given index. It will return that object, and the object will be uh, gone from the array list. We can set uh, uh, at a given index a given object, and it will also return the reference to that object. And here are examples. Basically, we can create an array list of cities, and that is an, a new Java util array list. We can add multiple elements, like for instance, London, New York, Paris, Toronto, Hong Kong. We can see that now the city list dot size is five the number of elements in the array list. Uh, if we are asking if Toronto is in the list, we can ask that with city list that contains Toronto. It will respond true because we added Toronto to the array list. Uh, we can check if the array list is empty with city list dot empty. We can continue in adding elements, like for instance, we add at index two, which was the index of Paris before Beijing which will shift now Paris at index 3, Toronto at index 4, Hong Kong at index 5. Now we have six elements in the list. We can remove Toronto, which basically now we have five elements in the list. For every index from 0 to the size of the city list, array list, 
we can print the element at index i with the get i method citylist.get i returns basically london then new york then beijing then paris then hong kong we can clean the array list we can create another array list in which we put circles or dates and basically it's a generic data structure that allows us to add and remove as many elements as we want however it has a problem we will see that most of the lines that we have in this program will have warnings and i will show it to you in eclipse so here we have a array list almost every line has a warning when we add elements, when we get elements, and when we remove elements, and so on. And the reason why is that the reason is that it uses objects as the super type. And that is relatively bad. Basically, if we have an array list and we make an assumption that the element that we return from the array list is a string or a circle, it's an assumption and we have to cast that object to uh, the actual type during uh, runtime. What if we can specify, and that's what we are going to do next, that the array list is an array list of elements of the type string. No warnings will be produced anymore. So what does it mean generic data structures? Generics means that we can specify the with the parameter, which is actually the type of the element of that array list, the type of the elements. So in the first case, city list is an array list of elements of the type string. That means that every time we add elements or we get elements from the list with the get i method, we get elements of the type string. We don't need to cast them anymore. Like in the case of our previous example, we got the element at index zero in the second array list, and we had to cast it to a circle before we call the method get area. In the new example, the array list is specified to know to uh, contain elements of the type circle. So it will only contain elements of the type circle or subclasses of circle. So when we actually get an element from the list, we can directly call methods for that class because we know that we could not have had in that list elements of another type. So this is a, a topic that we will cover la uh, later this semester. It's called generic programming. It allows us to create data structures with a parameterized type. So the type of the elements in the data structure are of a specific type, like in this case, the type string. Any questions? OK, no questions. Now, earlier today, we defined a stack of objects, and that was a stack using uh, an array of objects. But we, it was a little bit complicated and inefficient in the fact that as we added more and more objects, we were actually creating longer and longer arrays, which we were copying the elements from the old arrays. And creating big arrays takes a lot of time and space, because now we have multiple arrays that are used in memory. We can actually use the ArrayList class to implement the implementation of MyStack. So MyStack contains internally a private ArrayList list, which initially is empty. Every time we push an element on the, on the stack, we basically add the element at the end of the current list, ArrayList. Every time we pop an element from the stack, we, take the, we get the element at index get size minus one, which is basically the last element in our list. And we remove that element, which is basically removes the last element in the list, get size minus one, and we remove that last element. So at this point, we don't need to handle the size uh, of this, the array list. Basically, we don't need to remember explicitly how many elements we have in the stack and compare it with the number of elements available in the data structure. So all the methods that we've wrote for a stack are implemented using methods internally to array list. Now, the signature of the class is still the same. Basically, the signature of the class is the set of all the public methods. And therefore, 
we don't know how the class is actually implemented. It may be implemented with arrays of objects, or it may be implemented with an array list. But that doesn't really matter to a user. A user will use the method, the public methods, to actually access the data fields, return values, and so on. So the type of the elements does not matter, and therefore is completely hidden to the user. Now, a few more topics about inheritance and polymorphism. First, one of the data fields that we saw in the in data fields that we saw at the beginning in the class uh, uh, geometric object were protected. A protected data or a protected method in a public class means that it can be accessed by any class in the same package or its sub subclasses even if the subclasses are in different packages. So if we think about the visibility that modifiers that we learned, we had private, then we had the default visibility, that means that no modifier was used, which means that is available at the package level, protected, which means that any class in the same package or in a, a subclass in any other package sees the current data field, and public, which means that anyone can access those data fields, methods, or classes. So, public can be accessed from everywhere, can be accessed from methods in the same class, from classes in the same package, from subclasses, and from different packages. Protected means that you can access data fields or uh, methods in the same class, from the same package, or in classes in the same package, or from subclasses in any other package. Default visibility, which is basically when you don't use any visibility modifier, means that the member can be accessed in the same class or uh, in the same package, from classes in the same package. And finally, private means that, means that the member can only be accessed in the same class. And here we have examples. So consider that we have data fields X, Y, Z, and U. X is public, Y is protected, Z is uh, default modified or package level modified, and U is private. And we have a protected method M. From a class C2 in the same package, which does not extend the class C1, if we create an object of the type C1, O, as a new object of the type C1, we can access O.X because X was public. We can access O.Y either for assignment or for printing. We can access O.Z, so we can access protected, public, and default. We cannot access the private data field. Similarly, from a subclass C3 of C1, a class C3 that extends, extends C1. We can access the private, the public data field, the protected, the default package modified, but not we cannot access the privately uh, modified U. We can invoke the method M both from the class C2 for the object O or from the class C3. From a class C4, which is defined in the package P2, which extends the class C1, we can access the public data field X, the protected data field Y, because C4 is a subclass of C1, but we cannot access the package level or default modified data field Z and the private data field U. We can invoke again the protected method M because we are in a subclass of C1. From a class C5, defined in the package P1, different than the package P2, different than the package P1. If we create an object of the type C1, because it may be that we have a constructor, public constructor of the type C1, by default, we have it in the current class. We can access the public data field, but no other data field. We cannot access the protected data field because we are not in a subclass or in a class in the same package. We cannot access the default modified data field Z because we are not in the same package. We cannot access the private data field U or we cannot invoke the protected method M 
because we are not in the subclass and we are not in the same package. Any questions? In slide 37, when we added Beijing and increased our array, but it isn't the size of the array fixed, we are using an array list. So an array list does not have uh, it's an infinite size. Basically, an array list can be used to store an unlimited number of objects. So when we are adding Beijing at index 2, we can do it because this is an array list. We couldn't do it with an array, but an array list is a different class in Java. It's basically a class that allows us to have unlimited number of objects. Now, the other question is, wouldn't have been an issue if we tried to print the array without removing Toronto first? No. If we print all of the elements in the array, it will print basically London, New York, Beijing, Paris, Toronto, and Hong Kong. If we remove Toronto, then it will print five elements. Any questions? Okay. So, a subclass cannot weaken the accessibility of data fields. Basically, we may override a protected method in the uh, superclass and change its visibility to a uh, higher visibility, like public. However, a subclass cannot weaken the accessibility of a method defined in the superclass. So, if the method is defined in the superclass as, let's say, public, we cannot define it as uh, private or protected or default modified in the subclass. The visibility of the method in the subclass can only be uh, uh, equal or higher than the visibility of the method in the superclass. So we can define the method in the subclass as public only in this case. The modifiers that are used on classes except for the final modifier, can also be used for local variables in methods. And the final modifier uh, can uh, used on a, in a method, it actually defines uh, a constant. The same thing that it would define for a data field in, or static data field in a class. So the, static, the final modifier is, to, is used to define a constant. It, uh, we can use final for methods. It means that the method cannot be overridden by the subclasses. And we can also use final for a class that cannot be extended. Like for instance, in the Java Util package, the class math is defined as final. That means that we cannot implement, let's say, a class A that extends math. In the UML diagram, we use the uh, uh, arrows for defining generalization relationships, basically that a class is a subclass of another class, plus for public, minus for private, as we saw before, hash sign for protected, and tilde for package modified. So, for instance, for the previous example, let's go to here, we can define a class Let's say that this is the class C1, and the C1 has a public data field X of the type integer, a private data field Y, minus means private, of the type integer, a protected data field Z of the type integer, and a package modified data field, let's say t of the type integer. So hash sign means protected, and tilde means default, which is the same with package means that it's available in class in this in classes in the same package okay so by default also the class c is a subclass of the class object 
any questions. So now let's go over the lab for today. Uh, basically, we are going to implement several classes and several methods using what we learned today in class. So we'll start from the beginning. We first have to implement a class my integer, and the class my integer contains an int data field named value that stores the int value represented by the object, a constructor that creates a my integer object for the specified value, a get method that returns the int value, is even, is odd, and is prime that returns true if the value is even, odd, or prime. Then we have to implement static methods if even is odd is, is prime that return true if the value is even odd or prime. Then we have to implement static methods that take my integer as an object. So basically we check that the value of that my integer is even odd or prime. Then we need to implement equals overloaded for equals of int and equals of my integer that return true if the object is the same. We can also implement equals of object, which basically uh, it's the over, we override the method equals from the super class. Then we need to implement our own method parse int, which takes a string that represents an integer and converts it to an integer. We should draw the UML diagram for the class, implement the class, and then write the client program that tests all the methods in this class. So let's start from the beginning. We start with the defining the UML diagram for this class. So for that, we need to create a new UML diagram. So we are going to create a new class, my integer. And this new class my integer has a private data field value of the type int. And of course we will need constructors. So my integer that creates a my integer with value of zero and my integer that creates given an integer a my integer object of that value. We need to implement public methods for is even, is odd, and is prime. Then we need to implement static methods is even, is odd, and is prime. And these take integers as parameters. So is even as a static method. And is even is odd as a static method. And is prime as a static method. We need the same, but for methods that take my integer as an input, so let's call it m of the type my integer. We need to implement two methods for equal. We are going to do three, so equals takes i as an integer and returns boolean is equals that takes a my integer and returns boolean and we are going to implement the override the method that takes an object and it has a boolean 
let's actually put this so we can see it and finally we need to implement the method parse int again it's a static method and returns an integer okay so we need all of these methods and the class so let's actually just copy them and we are going to create a new class my integer and in the class my integer we define the private data field value we define the constructors which defines the default my integer with value of 0 we define another constructor which assigns to the data field value the value and then we need to define all of these methods so let's start from the beginning we need is even so let's return if the current value modulo 2 divided by 2 gives us the remainder 0 and then it's basically returns true now we need is odd the implementation is similar if the current value modulo 2 is different than 0 equal with 1 then prime so there is a definition of prime that basically says that any number that is divisible uh, greater than equal with 2 that is divisible with 1 and itself only divisible by 1 and itself so first of all If the number is less than 2, then we return false. Otherwise, we basically, first of all, have to, for 2, we have to return that is, if it's equal with 2, then we return true otherwise we write a loop for every integer i starting from 2 as long as i is strictly less than the value and i is incremented with 1 at every step if value modulo the integer i is equal with 0 then the value is divisible by i so the number is not prime otherwise it means that we reached the number and we didn't find any divisor from 2 to that value so we return true okay and this method returns a boolean Then we need to implement the static methods. So public static boolean is even, takes an integer as a parameter, and it does the same thing that we do did before. It basically returns if i modulo 2 is equal with 0. Now, Again, I don't like when I'm writing the same code multiple times. So 
one thing that we can do is to actually use it the method that we defined as static so instead of comparing the value equal with zero i can actually call the method is even for this class for the value so i don't need to implement it and similarly for is odd i can just call the matthew method is odd and then we implement the method is odd so again we define the method is odd as static we take an integer i and we return if i modulo 2 is different than 0 and now we can implement the method is prime So again, we take an integer i, and in fact, we can take the code that we already wrote for is prime before. And use it here. So here, my integer So now, inside the method here, if value was the global, the formal parameter, then we have an implementation. Let's continue with the rest of the implementation. For the object of the type my integer, all that we need to do is to call. is prime is even of m dot value and let's implement the next two methods so again we return my integer of m dot value of is odd of m dot value same for prime we don't duplicate any code we just use the previous definitions So this method returns a boolean and compares the current value with the value of i and the next method compares the value of the current object with the value of the object M and the next method compares the value of the current object 
with the value of the object O. So first we need to cast it to a my integer and then we can get this value. Finally, the parse int method takes a string and we need to return that the integer representing that string. So we first define an integer, let's call it n, is equal with 0. And then for every character in that integer, we make the assumption that is between 0 and 1. For every in the, uh, character, let's actually write a for loop from the most significant to the least significant character. So starting from index 0, as long as i is less than the length of that string. n is uh, summed with the previous n multiplied with 10 so we shift it to the left with one position plus the current character at index i minus the character for 0 so if it's for instance the character for 0 then we will get 0 if it's the character for 1 we would get the difference between the Unicode of 1 and the Unicode of 0, which is 1. So it translates one digit at a time from character to the corresponding integer digit. So now the only thing that we are left to do is to return the value of n. Okay, so let's actually check for syntax errors this entire program. The only error that I have is here we don't have a return statement other than that the entire class is now correct and complete so you see we have all the methods and we now have to test it so let's create a new class we are going to call it test my integer And in this new class, we are going to test my integer. So my integer constructors have to be tested first. So m1 is a new my integer. And if we want its value, let's also implement in the my integer class a to string method. So public static no string. To string returns that this is a my integer object with the value value. So now in our main in our main class we can actually print it. If we print it, it means that this is my integer with value 0. So let's actually test if this is even. So we can print m1 dot is even. And it will print that, yes, it's even. In fact, we can even put a label even m1. Now let's call is odd and is prime. So is odd and is prime. So that will call the those methods and it will print that is not odd and it's not prime. If we want to test it for two it will print that yes it's prime 
you want to test it for 11 it will print that its prime is true it's odd but it's not even now let's test the static methods so for the static methods we can call them with let's say is 11 odd so we call it with my integer dot is odd of 11 and similarly we can test if 11 is even and prime so we call is even and is prime and it basically prints that it's odd but not even and it's prime now let's do the same but actually using an object of the type my integer so is m1 odd m1 and m1 even and prime is m1 odd even or prime m1 being the one that we defined at the beginning so you see there is a static method that checks that or we there is the non-static method that checks that we can basically call it so it basically returns that the same values that we had for for directly calling the methods now we need to call to test the methods equal so is m1 equals 11 which basically will print that yes is true is m1 equal with a new my integer that contains 11 that also prints true then uh, that also will work the same if we call it with uh, basically uh, with the other definition that actually used object so we had three methods for equals let's delete one of them or comment it out let's delete it this still will print actually that my integer is equal with uh, m1 is equal with my integer of 11 now let's actually do a parsing so my integer dot parse int of the string that contains 123 will print the result of that method which is 146 that's wrong so let's see what we did wrong the old m m is multiplied with 10 we add to that ah we are adding it twice n is equal with n plus 10 okay now it's correct so let's run it again 123 we tested the entire class. Any questions? So the answer to that is that the main method can be put in a different class or you can put the main method in the same class my integer. So it's up to you. I don't really uh, care if you put your main method in the class my integer or you put it in a test class it doesn't really matter because basically <coughs> the testing is exactly the same my integer the same name with the class
Okay. Oh, three, we will get there. Yes, we will get there. Right now, let's continue with uh, two, and then we'll get to three. But you can check, you, you can basically name your class anything you want. Occurrences.java. Okay, next class. My point. So, let's create a new class. We call it my point. Again, we start from scratch. So my point represents a point with coordinates x and y. Two data fields x and y will represent the coordinates. A no argument constructor will create a point at coordinate 0, 0 in the Cartesian plane. A constructor will create a point at the given coordinates. Then we have get methods and uh, we can have also set methods. A method returns the distance between this point and another point object or with another, the distance between a point with a specified x and y coordinates. Uh, we will want to draw the UML diagram and then implement the class and then we write a program that creates two points and displays the distance between them. So let's start with the UML diagram. So my point is a new class. Let's actually just put it here. So my point has data fields X of the type double and Y of the type double has constructors default and another constructor that takes x and y of the type double then we have distance which returns the distance between the current object and another my point as a double and similarly another method distance that takes doubles x and y and let's say that we also and that's it actually uh, we can implement the two string method we can implement equals method and so on why not Let's do that. Okay, good. So let's implement them. We need my point. We create a class my point with a private data fields x and y constructor the default constructor we need to specify it because we have another constructor and that would invalidate the default constructor by default And this will set the data fields x and y to the formal parameters x and y. Then we implement the class, the method distance. Actually, first one takes a my point object and computes the distance. Let's implement the second one first, and then we can use the second one also in the first one. So this one will take two doubles. And the distance will be the square root of the sum of the squares 
So first we need what's the distance between this dot x minus x squared and the distance between this dot y minus y squared and now we can use it in this method Let's see what's the problem. Good. Okay. And now in the main method. So in the main method, we create two points. And the first point is... At coordinates if I remember exactly 10 10 no 0 0 let's just use a default constructor another point for 10 and 30.5 and we should print the distance between them P1 dot distance to P2. Let's run it. It tells me that that's the distance, which I believe it. Okay. If you want to submit the UML files, you can submit them. You can export them to image files. Let's put them on the desktop. I was on the desktop, in fact, it looks like it. Let's call them UML. Save it. And when you basically submit your uh, homework, you can submit the UML file together with the Java files. So it's optional. If you want to create it and submit it, you can do it not required. Okay, next problem. Occurrences of each digit in a string. Write a method that finds the number of occurrences of each digit in a string using the following header. We basically take a string and we return an array of integers, 10 integers, corresponding to how many zeros, how many ones, how many twos, up to how many nines uh, are there. So the method counts how many times any digit appears in the string. The value returned is an array of 10 elements. Each holds the count of that digit. That is the index. Okay. So let's create a new class. I'm going to call it occurrences or digit occurrences. The method that we are required to implement has this signature, so just take the signature. First thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to define this integer array A of integers 10. And now for every character in that string, let's use the character C in as dot two character array. Okay. Now, for that, we need to increment the corresponding digit. But what if it's not a digit? Uh, let's assume that the input is always correct. 
So what I'm going to do is just a of c minus 0 is incremented with 1. Finally, return a. So let's see if it works. So a will be an array of the following the digits in count of how many digits do I have in this. Now if we want our my method also to work for things that are not digits, I need an if statement. So I can put an if statement if the character if the character is greater than zero greater than equal with zero and and is less than equal with nine then I increment the digit otherwise I completely ignore it so now this means that I may also have other characters there okay but I, I don't consider them I don't care about those characters okay so now let's actually see if it works for every integer i starting from 0 as long as i is less than equal with 9 or less than 10 the number of digits for every index will be printed so we say here the number of i is a of i okay so now if we run it it tells us the number of zeros in that is zero there are no zeros the number of ones is four the number of twos is nine the number of threes is eleven the number of fours is six I think it's correct but let's actually test it more truly like I put two ones and three twos so the number of zeros is zero the number of ones is two the number of twos is three and so on it's correct any questions okay Next question, binary to hex. Write a method that parses a binary number as a string into a hex number. The method header has to have this signature and we can use any helper methods that we would like. So we take the binary value as a, a string and we return the hexadecimal value also as a string. There are two ways to implement this method. One way is to use decimal as the middle value. So Let's actually do it in both ways. So let's create a new class. We call it binary to hex. So the signature of the method should be this and we should return for the moment I'm going to return just null, I'm going to return the hexadecimal. So the first idea is to translate from binary to decimal and then from decimal to hexadecimal. Okay, so for that I basically will need to implement a method that takes from decimal and returns the hexadecimal and that method will take the output of another method that transforms from binary into decimal the original binary value So we need to implement two more methods. First, a method that transforms from binary to decimal. So this method with 
return an integer it takes the input as a string binary value so let's leave it empty for the moment we are going to return the value later let's write the signature of the other method this method returns a string that represents the decimal into hexadecimal and takes an integer d as the input good let's also return null so now we need to implement these two methods in the main method we are going to test them so we want to translate from let's say binary to hex 10101011 which could be which would be a b the output that we are waiting for would be a b okay so first we need binary to decimal it takes a string it returns an integer we define the integer equal with zero and for every character starting from the end of the string for every character from the end of the string as long as i is greater than equal with zero and i is decremented with one at every step we are going to increment n with the previous value of n actually let me think let's start from the beginning that way we just need to multiply with 2 for every position so from 0 as long as this is less than binary value dot length we increment n with the previous value of n multiply with 2 plus the new character so binary value character at index i minus the character 0 so for 0 we get 0 for 1 we get 1 ok so now decimal to hex we first define a string let's call it h for x and now we need to convert the number while d is greater than zero basically the digit that we are looking at which will also need to write another method to convert from one digit uh, let's write it here car one hex basically takes an integer and we transform it to hex so if the integer is less than 10 then we just return the digit 0 plus n and that will return the digits basically the characters from 
character 0 to character 9. Otherwise, if n is equal with it's greater than 10, in fact, we can just return n, in this case 10, minus 10, plus the character for a, uppercase a. Okay, now in both cases we need to cast to a character before we return, because these are integers. Okay, so now in our method hex to digit, we need to compute the remainder. That remainder we have to add it to the hex number. So the hex is the new remainder that we get. So in this case, we call the method one hex of D modulo 16 plus the previous hex number concatenated with the previous hex number and the digit is divided with 16 and we collect the quotient and we continue. So now if we run it, we have a out of index bound error in this line. So the character at index i for the length of the string should be known. Okay, let's take a look at the error again. Minus one. Ah, we changed the limits, but we didn't change the iteration. So now we return null, let's see here, we return x. And it returns exactly what we expected. So, in fact, we implemented not only binary to hex, we implemented binary to decimal and decimal to hex. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. So now let's do a different binary to hex. One that actually goes to the end and collects four digits at a time. And basically the way that it works is that it takes the last four digits, transforms them into the corresponding hex, uh, the previous four digits, and continues like that until the beginning of the string. This will be just a longer method that basically for every uh, four digits transforms it into the corresponding hexadecimal number. It's a little bit more complicated, but it will not take us long to implement it. So let's actually do it. So I'm going to copy the previous binary to hex into a new file. So in this case, we translate directly from binary to hexadecimal we will delete everything and start from the beginning. So, basically how it works, we need a method that takes the last four digits and transforms them. So, first thing that we need to find out is, uh, we can actually do it recursively, but we didn't learn recursion yet. So, let's do it with a for loop from the end of the string. Mm. Maybe the best way to do it is to first create basically a string that contains uh, preceding zeros. So let's start with a binary string. In fact, we can use the previous, the global parameter, the, the formal parameter. So while the length of that string divided by 4 is not equal with 0. But binary value 
is concatenate is equal with zero concatenated with binary value. So basically, we are padding the string at the beginning with uh, zeros. Um, we don't return anything yet, so just return the string to make sure that this part works. No, it does not. So if the binary length in modulo 4 is equal, it's different than 0, then we pad it. And we padding it, we padded it to with two zeros. Good. So now we can write a for loop starting from the beginning of the string. Actually, yeah, from the beginning, as long as i is less than the length of the string, because now it's padded from the beginning, so we don't care if we start at the beginning or at the end. And we increment with four digits at every time. We can now create a new string, let's call it one hex in binary. And that will be basically the substring from position i until position i plus 4. And now we can write a switch case statement on the one hex in binary. If it's the case that that is 0, 0, 0, 0, then the hexadecimal number, which we haven't defined yet, it's 0 concatenated with hex and break and now we have 16 cases one for one one for two one for three one for four one for five, one for six, one for seven, one for eight, one for nine, One for ten, in which case we return A. One for eleven, in which case we return B. One for twelve, in which case we return C. One for thirteen, in which case we return D. one for E and one for F. And there is no default. Uh, in fact, we should say that this line, the default case should never be reached. We basically are saying that we should never reach that case, an assertion is basically a correctness uh, issue in uh, in Java. So in this case, we are expecting the value to be, and 
let's return hex and we got b2 so we should swap the in fact it's easier to just modify it in an easier way okay and let's just put plus done so now if we run it it returns to b which is the correct uh, value okay so we implemented binary to hex in two ways let's continue sorting the characters in a string write a method that returns a sorted uh, version of the string okay so let's implement it let's call it sort cars again we start with the main method and we pass in a random string now of course you could use uh, uh, arrays.sort but always try to implement your own sorting. You are practicing programming and therefore you should actually learn how to sort uh, strings yourself. Personally, I would create uh, an array of characters, which is the representation of that array originally of characters. So s dot to character array. And then for every index, I will implement selection sort. For every position from the beginning, we compute the minimum. So we need the current minimum index. And we need a character for the current minimum. We need to iterate over the elements from i plus 1 up to the end of the array actually let's use the array we got rid of the string I mean we shouldn't use it anymore if the character current minimum is less than uh, a of i then it's not the minimum we should reset the minimum to a of i and the current minimum index to i and now if the current minimum index is different than i, we need to swap the elements. A of i, A of the current minimum index should be equal with A of i and A of i should be equal with the current minimum, assigned current minimum. Finally, we should create a new string that contains those characters. And let's just return a new string that takes A as a parameter. There is already a constructor that returns basically a string as a parameter. 
but let's see why doesn't it work it did not sort because you see that the characters are not in sorted order so let's put a breakpoint and start debugging the program so let's enter that method we define the array it contains 26 characters current minimum is a we iterate from i plus 1 to the end of the array the value is never less so we don't need to assign a different current minimum now the current minimum is s ah here it should be j save it run it again it should work this time but it didn't let's debug again so yep the problem is that here it should, should be j sorry for that i didn't observe that and now it's uh, returned in the correct order if the current minimum is greater than a of j now it's fine so let's see the final method this is it any questions okay good next let's define a class triangle that extends geometric object from the lecture notes and it contains three data fields side one two and three with default values of one the no argument constructor should create a default triangle a constructor that creates a triangle with the specified sides one two and three the accessor methods for all of the data fields a method get area that determines the area of the triangle uh, using Heron's formula the method get perimeter that returns the perimeter and the two string method that returns a string representation of the triangle the, draw the uml diagram basically let's start with that so let's create a new class diagram i'm going to create first the super class so we know that we have a class geometric object in the lecture notes and this class has data fields color the type string field of the type boolean and date created of the type java util date Next, it also has the uh, constructors and other methods. We don't need to implement, uh, let's implement them all. Why not? Takes color of the type string and field of the type boolean then it contains the accessors get color which returns a string then it contains is field which returns a boolean get a set color which takes a string object and returns void and set field which takes a field boolean and returns void and has the two string method let's say it also has the abstract method 
get area, which must be implemented in the subclass, and similarly has the abstract method get perimeter, which must be implemented in the subclass. Okay, good. So now we can implement our subclass. So we can define a subclass. Okay. So the class triangle has side one of the type double two and three also of the type double has constructors for triangle the default constructor and the constructor that takes the sides as parameters Uh, also has a method to string and has accesses and mutators for all of these parameters so it has get side one returns a double and set side one That takes a double and returns void. And we can actually duplicate these three times. So we have this and this. So get side one, two, and three. Set side one, two, and three. So now we have the, top, the complete UML diagram for our classes. And we are not going to specify the get area and get perimeter because those are uh, must be implemented in the subclass. So now we can implement this class. I already have geometric object in my uh, from the lecture notes. You can just copy it. And now we can implement the class triangle. Okay, so for the class triangle, we need to implement the private data fields side 1 with the default value of 1, side 2 with the default value of 1, and side 3 with the default value of 1. Then we can implement the constructor triangle that creates a default triangle and the one that creates a triangle with given sides okay same for the other two sides okay Now we need to implement the accessor methods for all of the data fields. Get side one, return side one. Of the type double. And now we can do it for the other two data fields side 2 and 3. Now we have to implement the mutators. Okay. And let's duplicate it three times. for side 2 and for side 3 
excellent then we need get area and get perimeter and to string so let's start with the to string so we are going to say that this is a triangle with sides side 1 plus concatenated with side 2 concatenated with side 3 ok now we can implement the perimeter So we return side 1 plus side 2 plus side 3. And now we can implement the get area. So I don't remember exactly what the formula for Hero's formula, but I believe that is the following. We define P as the square root no as side 1 plus side 2 plus side 3 divided by 2 and then math dot square root of the product of p minus side 1 I believe it was squared or multiplied. Let's let's look for Hero's formula for the area of a triangle. S will be that value and then square root of s multiplied with the rest okay good so p multiplied with this p minus side one minus side two minus side three done so now all that we need to do is to test this class so let's implement the method And this method will create a triangle with random sides so let's say 19 38 and 19 again and now we can actually get the sides but most importantly let's get the area let's actually also add the area in the two string method maybe also the perimeter So let's print the triangle. Done. So it printed that triangle with the given uh, sides. The area is zero, so which means that we may have not computing this correctly, but uh, that's okay. Let's take a look again. What did it print? Why is the area zero? This is not double division. This is double division. Let's see. Let's put a breakpoint and start the debugger. So, oh, wrong method. <laughs> 
30, it's equal with 38, and this is the square root of P multiplied with uh, P minus side 1, multiply with P minus side 2, multiply with P minus side 3. And side 2 was 38, so this gives us 0. So it is correct. If the formula, if the hero's formula is correct, then we are correct about that too. Which means that our triangle is probably impossible to obtain. It's actually a triangle with uh, a flat triangle, so which is true. This is a flat triangle. Okay, let's run it again. And the area of this triangle is 6, which is true. There's the area of that triangle is 3 multiplied with 4 is a right angle triangle. So the implementation was actually correct. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you very much and have a good day. I think we finished the lab. Except that our triangle is not exactly the one in the lecture notes. So let's stop the recording.